By the beginning of 16th century, Delhi had already established itself as one of the major cities of Asia, a metropolis ruled by clan of leaders coming from Rajputs to Turkic slave dynasty to Khiljis, Tughlaqs, Sayyids, Lodis. It was also a major focal point of cultural exchange in this region. But amid this grandeur, another invasion was knocking at the doors of Delhi. Zahiruddin Muhammad Babur The ruler from the Farhana Valley in Central Asia entered Indian soil through western frontiers crossing the historic Khyber Pass riding a strong army of 12,000 men. Delhi Sultanate was by then already weakening and shrinking under Lodi dynasty monarch Ibrahim Lodi. It were the cracks within the empire which gave Babur an entry in India. Well, there are so many uh, theories as to why he uh, got interested in invading India. Um, one is that he was being uh, pushed out of Central Asia and therefore he was looking to carve a dominion of his own as a powerful uh, Timurid prince and that was the impulse which was driving him. Uh, the second is that uh, uh, he was invited to India by disgruntled uh, Lodi nobles and chieftains in India who, was, who were against the Lodi regime. Eyeing the crown for himself, defector Dalat Khan Lodi wrote to Babur asking him to sack Delhi and overthrow Ibrahim Lodi. It is at the same time that Babur decided to move towards Punjab and he claimed this territory to be his uncle's territory, Uluk Beg Mirza's territory. And he, in fact, he sent his emissary to, uh, to Ibrahim Lodi, the Lodi Sultan of Delhi. But his emissary, uh, Rashid, Mullah Rashid, he was stopped in between by Daulat Khan Lodi, the then governor of Dipalpur, Punjab. Uh, because Daulat Khan Lodi didn't want any cordial relationship between Babur and Ibrahim Lodi because Daulat Khan had his own designs in Punjab. By the year 1524, Babur had established himself capturing Kabul and Samarkand. He then rode out to attack Delhi, which led to the first battle of Panipat. The idea perhaps for the Afghan chiefs and the Rajputs was that after invasion, uh, like some other uh, earlier invaders, like the Moor, uh, for instance, uh, Babur will go back. But Babur actually eventually decides to stay here and have a kingdom of his own uh, here. It seems uh, when Babur is writing uh, in his Tuzke Babri or in Babar Nama, we find a reference that Babur is not happy uh, that Rana Sangha did not join in the battle of Panipat. And Babur is saying that, you know, that I'm being invited and then Rana Sangha has not come here. And uh, so that, that shows that probably Rana Sangha was somewhere uh, connected in, in inviting Babur. I don't uh, think that Rana Sangha was part of any uh, larger uh, coalition built by the Lodis. Uh, and the tradition that he was also instrumental in inviting Babur uh, because he was uh, uh, an ally against a common enemy is a weak tradition and I don't really think that uh, was the case. I think in the dynamics of the 16th century, early 16th century politics, domestic, you know, in domestic terms within India, uh, Sultanate, Lodi Sultanate, as also conditions in Central Asia, Iran, uh, etc., that, uh, uh, that Babur had to come in any case, even if uh, Rana Sangha and Daulat Khan Lodi may not have invited him. Ibrahim Lodi was killed, his army humiliated, 
routed and defeated. Delhi Sultanate overthrown. The foundation of Mughal Empire in India was laid on April 27, 1526. The Khutbah was read in Babur's name in Delhi. Delhi Sultanate began to decline after Timur's invasion towards the end of the 14th century, uh, but somehow survived and Delhi retained its central position uh, in the 15th century when the Sayyids uh, retained, it, retained it as their capital. Um, and it was only Sikandar Lodi who moved away from Delhi and founded a new city. Uh, Agra in 1506 and then that city became the capital of the Afghan Empire but that apart it's fair to say that with the defeat of uh, Ibrahim Lodi in the Battle of Panipat uh, the end of the Delhi Sultanate come if Afghan Empire was clearly uh, there and it was the beginning of a new dynastic rule in India. But Babur's journey to invade Delhi had started much before, from these lands of Central Asia. Born in a Turco-Mongol ancestry of Timur Lung and Chengiz Khan, he succeeded his father, Umar Sheikh Mirza, the ruler of fertile Farhana Valley region in present-day Uzbekistan. Abu Said Mirza, his, great, his grandfather, has divided the entire uh, legacy of Timur into five. So one goes to his father, another goes to his uncle, uh, that is Kabul goes to his uncle, Samarkand goes to another uncle, and then Kunduz goes to another uncle. So that way he is fifth one uh, amongst the, uh, the descendants of Amir Timur. So the Central Asia divided amongst the Timurids and they all became very small, small principalities and they all were fighting amongst themselves to get a better hold of the territories. Baba's grandfather was the grandson of a son of Timur, you know, and Timur had conquered these parts. So there was this, this understanding that this large parts of Upper North India, Punjab, you know, Afghanistan, uh, Khurasan is, is Timurid, you know, and that Timurid legacy has to be reconquered. Timur in turn belonged to a Turkish tribe with some Mongoloid antecedents, you know. So going back to Mongols of the Changiz Khan hordes. But also from his mother's side, Babur's mother's side, uh, you know, uh, they descended from uh, Changiz Khan. Changiz Khan's son, Chaktai. Since they dominated that territory of Chaktai Khan, they started calling themselves Chaktai Tars. And that's what Babur called himself Chaktai Tars. But at the same time, because he's also related to Mongol, he's tracing his origin from Mongols also. And we find that uh, Babur is following Yasai Changezi. The rules which have been laid down by Mong uh, Changez Khan, uh, the rules of government. And we find Babur and Amir Timur both uh, governing their uh, area or the kingdom more according to Yasai Changezi than according to Quranic traditions. Even after conquering Delhi and Agra, Babur was riding back and forth to Farhana to hold his Central Asian domain. And that led to his vassals and governors facing constant challenges from the local rulers. Some of them very strong and organized. For eras known as brave warriors, the Rajputs were the ones to pose major challenge. Now once Rana Sangha realized that Babur had intentions to stay in India and perhaps even expand territories that he has won in Battle of Panipat, he stitched a coalition of local confederates of Rajput rulers and his Lodi loyalists to force Babur out of India. Now that led to two sides clashing in the Battle of Kanwa. The battle was fought near Fatehpur Sikri on March 16, 1527. Result, a decisive victory for Babur's Mughal army over what was believed to be two lakh strong army commanded by Rana Sangha and his coalition. Mughal army was very different from the Lodi army or the Rajput, Rajput army of uh, Khanwa or uh, Mewar, also of uh, Chanderi. 
because Mughal first uh, speed was their main uh, thing. Uh, second is gunpowder. Third is Tolugma, that is their commandos. Second is Iltamish, their reserved foes. Indians never had this concept of reserved foes. So when their army is tired fighting, uh, there was no one to replace those tired soldiers. But Babur army, though he was he was only 25,000 in number in comparison to the one lakh army of Ibrahim Lodi, yet he has this advantage of, uh, you know, over this uh, Lodi. Well, the Mughal battle strategy was uh, heavily uh, based on the use of artillery and gunpowder. Uh, and that was the decisive uh, factor. You know, the Mughal army was able to surround the Afghans from all over, you know, all over a tactics which is referred to as Tulagma, Tulagma tactics, where basically the, the entire army which is, uh, you know, uh, which is facing the, the Mughals would be surrounded from all direction and, you know, there will be mounted archers, uh, you know, shooting arrows. Not for nothing the battle plan which uh, Babur use uh, is called the Rumi battle plan or uh, the Turkish battle plan in which there was a Turkish uh, strategist who was uh, trying to um, build uh, a new formation of use of guns and uh, muskets and cannons. The consolidation of Mughal Empire has thus begun. After Khanwa and defeat of Rana Sangha, Babur's army captured another Rajput stronghold, Chanderi in Malwa. In what was his one of the major expansionary engagement, Babur rode eastwards, attacking Lohani and Lodi Afghans and routing their forces along with their allies in the Battle of Khagar. Now that event made Babur an undisputed conqueror of the vast areas extending past Bengal in the east, Gwalior in the south and Khyber in the west. For the expansion in central India and Rajasthan, an opening of further possibilities of expansion, Khanwa was an important battle and Akar was yet another important battle, but I would still regard Panipat as the most decisive uh, battle in so far as the history of establishment of the Mughal rule in India is concerned. The confederacy of Afghan rulers with their centre in Bihar was led by Sultan Jalaluddin Khan Luhani and Sultan Mahmud Lodi. The prowess of Babur's traders could be assessed from the fact that Sultan of Bengal, Nusrat Shah, accepted peace proposals hastily and owed allegiance to the Mughals. He didn't try to subdue them. He, in fact, bargained with them and he gave them the territories to rule. He didn't interfere in their administrative matters. He just told them that you acknowledge me as your emperor and you keep on governing your territories. Be it the Afghani ruler of Kalpi, uh, of Gwalior, of um, uh, of Bihar and of Bengal, he is letting them govern their areas. But at the same time, he wanted himself to be acknowledged as emperor. But for Babur, the challenges to have a firm footing in India were only growing. It would take two of his successors to counter before the established Mughal Empire. In North India, Afghans were the formidable um, force. They might have been defeated by, you know, defeated in the Battle of Panipat, but that was the force led by Ibrahim Lodi. A large section of the Afghans were still actually unconquered, you know, by the Mughals. They were also pushed towards the eastern region, and therefore it was inevitable for Babur to actually march towards eastern India, Bihar, all the way to Bengal, uh, for him to be able to establish an empire uh, here, which we know that he was actually not able to establish on a firm footing. The difficulty of not being able to crush entirely the opposition to the Mughal, newly founded Mughal rule by the Afghans on the one hand, Rajputs on the other, and other principalities that, uh, that all along 
uh, both Babur and subsequently Humayun, and together also they were in engaged in those political campaigns, you know, wars and and and, and battles, uh, which were uh, uh, taking taking place, which actually continues for the next 30 years period, you know, 1526 to 1556 period, that we know that eventually after the second battle of Panipat, that the, the Mughals are able to establish themselves here on a firm uh, firm footing. The center of power has now moved to Agra. Though Agra was chosen as the capital of Sultanate in Lodi era, it was under the Mughals the city touched its prime. After Babur, four of his descendants, Humayu, Akbar, Jahangir and Shah Jahan, ruled from the mighty Agra fort. Sikandar Lodi, I would say, was the first one to shift uh, or to move towards Agra. In fact, he is the one who has founded Agra. Um, Agra, if you see strategically, it commands the trade route. Trade route to Rajasthan, trade route to Deccan, and trade route to uh, western, west side. So, Gujarat, Malwa, and also towards the extreme northern side. Remember, this is the time in the 1415, uh, early 16th century, which is the time of the emergence of the Rajputs. You know, Rajput, uh, you know, ch uh, chieftaincies are emerging in a big way uh, in this in this period, and controlling uh, the Rajputs would be uh, perhaps easier, um, and controlling that region, uh, um, both Rajputana and Malwa, uh, from their base in Agra, would be perhaps easier. Agra would also be safer, uh, you know, in terms of the cap uh, capital city. Just to keep an eye on the Rajput movement, because Rajputs were his. Uh, his very strong enemies uh, and they were the only counterparts as far as the valor and bravery is concerned. Just like the sultans and rulers of the past, Babur began to scout cities in his own ways. Coming from the tribe which were now getting synonymous with the terms like barbarians, Babur set to travel within the confines of India. In between, he also penned down his autobiographical account, Babur Nama. Written in Chaktai Persian, the 40-page account is a compilation of magnificent impressions he gathered of India. The Indian method of counting, the great craftsmen and clothing to its flora and fauna. So it can be divided into two parts. The first part is about his uh, uh, life in uh, uh, Fargana and uh, Kabul and Ghazni and the second part is about India, people of India, culture of India. And since he was from outside India, he uh, documented many things which uh, otherwise would have appeared very uh, normal and not worthy of uh, mention by any Indian historian. So that makes uh, Baba Nama uh, some kind of a unique text for uh, modern historians also. From the simple houses to great palaces of Rajput kings, Baba Nama compiles his admiration in great details. In particular, he had greatly admired the palace completed by Raja Man Singh Tomar of Gwalior. His fondness for horticulture, his fondness of music, his fondness for um, uh, singing, it's, it's very well evident in Babar Nama. In fact, Babar uh, is credited to have brought this Chahar Bagh pattern or the uh, square garden pattern into India. And uh, he is introducing that, for example, Aram Bagh in Agra, in Dholpur, a Bagh in Ilofur, uh, he has laid down. So the sim systematic gardens were laid down for the first time in India by Babar. As a horticulturist, he's improved the quality of grapes and melons in India because he was very fond of wine. Even the social system of India, its caste system, finds a mention in Babar Nama. Another of his great emphasis was on natural beauty of India. Her forests, animals, birds 
five types of parrots, about the fruit banana, the flocking geese and even leaves of apple trees. This is a trait which is subsequently to be found very, very uh, clearly, um, you know, in amazing details, uh, once again, uh, under Jahangir, you know, who early in the 17th century, when he writes his uh, autobiographical narrative, uh, Tuske Jahangiri, he is also once again writing about flora, fauna, um, etc. in the same manner in which he would be, uh, Babur would be, you know, great-grandfather would be uh, would be writing early in the 16th, 16th century. So these were very accomplished people. I mean, these were not uh, some barbarians coming and, you know, looting and massacring and, you know, uh, creating difficulties. They were, they, came, they had a broad-based framework, political framework. They had ideals uh, to implement, uh, implement them, create an empire and govern, you know. Mentioned also a great poet in his memoir, he introduced the concept of garden palaces in India. Gardens at the Mughal installations in Agra, Sikri and Dholpur are said to have been laid during his times. But the story ended abruptly as Baba died within just four years of his rule in December 1530, aging just 47. It's noted that in India, most of his time was spent fighting and traveling back and forth Ferhana. Now that leaves his place in the history more of a conqueror or a fighter and less of an empire builder. A feat which his successor and grandson Akbar and his grandson Shah Jahan went on to accomplish. In an account of his death, it said he gave away his life for his son and successor Humayun. Wise men of his court suggested that Prince Humayu, who was very ill, might be saved if Babur gave away his most precious possession. When Babur was very much troubled because of the illness of Humayu, uh, Babur was asked by, uh, he, he got a dream, and then it was asked that uh, if he gets well, uh, what can you pay for his uh, well-being? So Babur said that uh, I'll give, uh, give, uh, my favorite jewels and everything. He said, no, jewels and all, it doesn't matter. So what, what else can you give? He said, I can give my life. So that's a very famous uh, anecdote. The baton of Mughal Empire was thus passed on to his son, Humayun. Babur's advice to Humayun uh, and the whole, uh, you know, uh, empire that was eventually created, the character of the empire that was created is very, very important. And it is about tolerance. You know, ensuring that there will be tolerance in terms of uh, religious differences, etc. Uh, it is also about um, justice. That, uh, you know, law will be you know, equal for everyone. Within Islam also, they were very, very eclectic. And that eclecticism is to be seen uh, in the, uh, in the um, discussions uh, often happening uh, with regard to whether and to what extent uh, from time to time uh, the Mughals were able to negotiate with the, uh, you know, Safavid Persia, uh, which was aggressively pushing for a certain kind of Shia Islam. Babur was buried at first in his gardens on the banks of River Yamna at Agra. But his body was moved to Kabul after nine years, for he had left a wish that his final resting place should be in his favorite garden in Kabul. There was this very interesting combination of uh, warrior and writer and ruler. And yes, he had very little time to rule in India, so we don't know what would have been the shape of the Mughal Empire had he lived. But that's a counterfactual question. But the legacy which he left for Humayu was to a very large extent uh, something on which Humayun built the further the second round of expansion of the Mughal Empire.